fingers. <laughs> now the fingers that post digital science and education journal and book series were not just founded to, to provide another publishing venue for stuff. They were really founded to challenge certain instrumentalist and determinist assumptions about about the relationships between technology and education and actually to to point that that uh, we don't really cannot really just when we speak about technology we cannot really just speak about technology we also need to speak about all kinds of social material aspects of technology usage and this is really where and this is really where we uh, 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 where this book is situated. So uh, the editors, uh, Tim Fons, Jill Etkin, and Derek Jones have done an amazing job collecting uh, some 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 beautiful chapters about various aspects of this of this problem. And in this session, we will really discuss all those things. So rather than present things, we will just discuss. And now I would just like to say briefly a couple of words about the format. So we have three like sub-sessions or thematic sessions. Each session will have a few, a few speakers up front, but basically those people will just briefly introduce themselves. And then after that, what we will have, we will just discuss things and we will discuss uh, not just things said in the, written in the book, but we will discuss issues much, much more generally. Also, I would like to emphasize that book launch is not just an occasion to discuss things, it's also an occasion to celebrate, to congratulate all the authors, to congratulate all the editors and everybody else who was involved in production of this book. And without further ado, really, I would like to start the first session. In this, in this first session, We've got a uh, few speakers. It's Tim Fons, Margaret Beerman, Cheryl Boyd, Di Hansel, Rachel Buchanan, and Karen Gravit. I would like to just invite people to introduce themselves in a few sentences, and then we can start with the discussion. So the floor is yours. Tim. OK, thanks, Peter. Um, it so I'm Tim Fawns. I'm a senior lecturer in clinical education at the University of Edinburgh, and I mostly teach on a fully online master's in clinical education, um, which you might see a few mentions of in the book. Um, and my colleagues, Jill Aitken and Derek Jones, uh, Derek's um, selfishly retired now, but um, we, we were teachers on that program and it led us to think quite, um, quite a lot about these issues. And it's a real honor um, to have been able to be one of the editors of this um, volume of chapters from lots of different authors that are just um, diverse and wonderful. Um, and also to have the speakers that we've managed to get to come along today is, is sort of a dream for me. So I'll, I'll leave that as my introduction, but I'm so pleased and thanks everyone for coming. Margaret, over to you. I think I've got a running list that says Tim, Margaret, Sharon, then Di, then Rachel, then Karen. So Margaret, next, please. Hi, um, thanks, Tim. And thanks for inviting me as well, too. It feels like a real privilege to be here in um, such wonderful company. I'm Margaret Bierman. I'm a professor at Cradle, the Centre for Research and Assessment and Digital Learning. And um, there's so many um, threads in this discussion, this book that um, cut across my life in terms of having taught on many, uh, many a postgraduate certificate, um, some of them online, some of them face to face, um, a big interest in, in digital and post digital. And um, of course, a big interest in the wonderful company. Uh, sure. Hello, I'm Sharon Boyd and I agree it's amazing company, wonderful to be part of this, this team and also to, to come along and chat here today. I'm based at the Royal Dick School of Veterinary Studies in Edinburgh and I am director and deputy director of a couple of the programmes that we have, also fully online um, taught 
master's programs and do a little bit of undergrad teaching as well. And um, my interests bring together my past history of environmental science and digital education and now the clinical uh, teaching and One Health aspect. And um, that's all for me. Thank you very much, Dai. Uh, you need to turn on the mic. Sorry, I had a little a coughing fit earlier. It's the, it's the pollen. Um, I'm Dan Hansel. I'm Emeritus uh, Professor of Higher Education at University of Edinburgh. And really, if, if Edinburgh was truly in the 21st century, I should be called Digital Professor because I only exist nowadays virtually. Um, so I do a, a little bit of tutoring on uh, a course that Tim's run, Tim runs. And... Um, a little bit of uh, do doctoral supervision and I do writing and I'm probably one of the few people in the world that actually makes an, an attempt often vain to read all the papers that come out with the name of someone from cradle on them which is uh, really due to my retirement I think or semi-retirement. Thank you very much Rachel. Hi everybody, it's Rachel Buchanan. I'm um, Associate Professor in Education at the University of Newcastle, Australia. Um, very excited to be here. I've spent half my teaching doing huge face-to-face um, -face courses with pre-service teachers and the other half doing online teaching of um, teachers involved in a Masters of Educational Leadership. And it's been fabulous to explore the kind of differences uh, in those experiences through the exploration of post-digital theory. So it's, it's really great to have an avenue to have discussions about this uh, and to publish in this um, area. So it's awesome to be here. Thank you very much. And Karen? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Karen Gravitt. I'm a senior lecturer in higher education at the Surrey Institute of Education. Um, thanks so much to, to Tim um, and colleagues for inviting me to, to be here today. Really looking forward to the discussions. Um, it was a, a privilege to be invited to have a conversation about the, the book. Feels like quite a while ago now um, and to talk through the themes. So many uh, relevant ideas and issues for, for our practice. My research is into uh, student engagement relational pedagogies, um, digital and post-digital contexts. And I also teach on a um, on master's programmes and lead a postgraduate certificate in learning and teaching in higher education. Um, and I teach at, at Surrey and also at the Institute of Education at UCL. So really looking forward to all the conversations and, and ideas um, and takeaway points from this morning and this evening. Thank you very much. Uh, well, after these brief introductions, we will now go to discussions and questions and comments and whatever people got about the book or about issues in and around the book. I would just like to mention two things before we start. The first thing is that I understand that the book is paywalled and not everybody has access. So if you need the PDF book, just email me. My email is in the, in the chat for the third time in a row and you can just, I'll just email you a PDF copy. So for anybody in the audience who wants to get the book, you can get it now. And we've actually already got the first question. And Jill asked about how the, the panel sees the longer term impact of the pandemic playing out in this sphere. Anybody from the panel? I'm, I'm witnessing a tension. Uh, in that there's people that want post-pandemic to snap back to whatever happened before because that was their comfort zone and they just want the whole thing to be finished. And yet I'm also seeing other people who and students who love the fact that things went online, they could study from the comfort of their own home uh, and are now expecting that, that flexibility and online delivery to be part of what traditionally was understood as face-to-face -face education. So I don't, I don't think there's a fixed outcome post-pandemic because there's these two um, kind of possibilities playing out of whether we go back to whatever project trajectory existed before the pandemic versus those that see this as a real opportunity for incorporation of better use of digital technologies and, and had fun being part of 
that flexibility and, and the changes in delivery. But, you know, that's just the view from one university in Australia that has a, um, a real sense of let's get back to campus activation, let's get back our students back. So I'm, I'm seeing this real tension, but I know that's not the only way it's been experienced. Thank you very much. I am. Um, um, you go, Di. No, I was going to let you go. Go on. Oh, I was going to say further something. Away, I, not digitally. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was going to mull a little bit on that that point and say that it's interesting to observe, as well being from Australia, that our states experienced the pandemic extremely differently, having been up in Brisbane recently and had a bit of envy for their pandemic experience. And so I'm wondering if we're also going to see a real diversity in in the outputs across the board. I mean, some places are, have been much more um, affected, others not. And I, I, I suspect it's also going to bleed into a whole range of other issues that are not simply about digital, not digital, place and not place. I think there's going to be a whole lot of other things. And uh, sadly, I think, and I use the word sadly, um, advisedly, geopolitical um, challenges um, will also start to bleed into uh, our world. And that, that, that may have, I think, as Rachel says, unknown, you know, dynamic um, consequences. Thank you. Uh, a couple of things, really. One is that I think whenever new technologies come along, um, everybody get it, gets it wrong about the best way to actually use them. Um, I very, very early in my career, program learning came along and uh, the Royal Navy in Portsmouth, where I was based at the time, bought all these little um, roller paper program learning things, vast numbers of them, and, and got these poor young apprentice sailors on them all day. And it was only after a while that we actually learned how to to really make make the most of those possibilities there. And I think it happens with with all with all technology. And I think one of the challenges we've got with, with, with online learning, which I hope this book um, does, and I think it does get to grips with, is it, what we might call the wisdom of practice. And how do, we, how do we share how people are effectively recrafting teaching and learning in a different kind of context with different forms of, of interaction? And that I think is, um, is the really, really difficult thing. And if I give you an example of that, because there's something I was talking about at my, with, with some colleagues at Bournemouth University, where I have a sort of visiting, visiting role. Um, if you think of things like um, Q and A um, options um, on some of these standard pieces of software like Teams and Zoom and so on, um, a student can ask a question in an unobtrusive and uh, potentially unembarrassing way. They can actually post up a question. And then other students can actually say, yeah, uh, that's a question I'd like asked too. You can't actually do that in, 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 a, in a live lecture theatre in the same way, nor can you actually save those kinds of questions so that they become a sort of real evidence base for a kind of set of FAQs. So th those are just two tiny examples, it seems to me, about this kind of um, practical wisdom that we've got to all kind of surface and, and share and, and communicate, I think. Because <clears throat> I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm doing some work with, a, um, with a, someone in a university in, um, in, in, in Eastern Europe, and it's clear that um, they see the standard way to go towards online learning, particularly in the light of COVID, um, is simply to have lots of techie people offering courses in how to use Moodle. And in a way, that's the last thing that teachers know. That somehow or other, we have to break that, that barrier. An amazing point, thank you very much. Uh, we've got a few more comments and questions and I would perhaps Nicola asked a very interesting question and actually we've already got a few answers in the chat maybe if you could just quickly tell us something about it so that to, to kick off this discussion Nicola 
Uh, yeah, sure, Peter. So um, I think a lot of universities uh, and even, you know, even though COVID was not necessarily, you know, well designed online, um, people, uh, there are university managements that assume that you can scale online programs really quickly um, and not thinking about the resource implications. So I asked the question to colleagues of how are your universities, you know, how are you convincing them to adequately resource, especially in terms of skilled human capacity, these postgraduate um, uh, taught programs. And also, I think a lot of the chapters uh, brought that up as being really important that we shouldn't overlook um, the importance of um, human capacity. So thanks, Nicola. One, one thing I'd like to say, um, look like Karen might want to come in next, is actually that question is, part of what launched the book. Um, so Peter said to us that we could write a commentary as, as a, a prompt for the call for papers. And the commentary was called something like online learning as embodied socially meaningful experience. And it started out with um, these two premises that we wanted to argue against. And one was that you can scale up um, without investing in humans, human capacity uh, I've forgotten the other one, something about oh, online learning is socially impoverished. And the two things go together. If it's socially impoverished, then it probably is okay to scale it up. Um, but if it isn't socially impoverished, which is what we argued on the basis of our experience with our own masters and talking to people who actually had already established themselves as online education experts before the pandemic, then you do need to invest significantly in both technological resources and in the people who are actually working on the ground. Um, so I guess you could argue that the book itself is part of that work um, to try to convince people that that is what's needed. But I'll, I'll pass on to Karen. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know whether it's naive, but I'm quite optimistic about post pandemic and some of the lessons that we can learn from from what's happened. And, and I think, you know, following on from what you were saying there, Tim, one of the things that comes through really nicely in the book um, is the, you know, the real sort of um, disruption of these hard binaries between online and face to face as being, you know, something completely separate. And I think, you know, in terms of resourcing and, and, and going forward in the ways in which we approach um, online learning and teaching, then, then muddying that, that artificial boundary can only help us because it, it forces us to realize that all teaching and learning needs to be appropriately resourced. Um, and actually that, that online and face-to-face -face learning is entangled. And I think it's a really, you know, really positive outcome of, of our experiences um, during COVID. And, and also the other thing that I think is really positive is that, you know, the, the spotlight's really been shone. I mean, the, the dislocation that we've all experienced has really shone the spotlight on, on issues to do with engagement, to do with connection and to do with relational pedagogies. And actually going forward, I think if we need, if we want to foster relationships, relational pedagogies and, and learning and teaching that that does enable us to connect to our students then that, that needs humans and it needs resourcing and it needs investment and, and it needs valuing so so I'm hoping that the the new issues and questions raised um, during our experiences will encourage um, educators and institutions to think more thoughtfully about how we resource and, and go forward with our with our practice. And I think that the question of resourcing really is closely, closely linked to what Amina said about social justice and really the relationship between online postgraduate education and social justice. So perhaps if we could steer the discussion towards Amina's comment and question. Anybody? Amina, perhaps? Oh, um, well, I was just curious how it, how postgraduate, the pursuit of postgraduate education might be repositioned as a means to achieve social justice, or if that is necessary. Um, Tim brought up some great comments as well further, further up. There's a nice discussion going on. I would actually love to hear as well from maybe Di um, and those who wrote about feedback 
how they might see feedback as social justice or if they do. Wow. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm very good on that, but um, uh, I think, I think in some ways, um, online learning has actually brought greater equality or greater equity in terms of access to resources. Um, when I was young, which was a very, very long time ago, and a, and a, and a student, um, big things were about, you know, whether you could afford certain textbooks, whether you could actually get to the library um, often enough. Um, we had at, at uh, Lancaster, as I was, I was then early in my career, um, we tried to attract a lot of mature students, uh, and we were very successful at that. But we discovered that a lot of the women students who were mothers were having to go home at three o'clock to pick up their kids. And the library, for example, wouldn't allow you to take out a, uh, a short loan book until half past four. Now, all of those things kind of changed when things became so much more accessible. Um, and I think that one of the sort of, you know, blessings is that, you know, there is greater <clears throat> possibilities, I think, within the system that don't necessarily cost, cost lots of money. Um, on the other hand, I think we have to really think very, very hard about what it is we're offering and what our relationship is with, with learners. There's been an awful lot of um, discussion in the in the recent past about the student as client and the student as customer, um, I don't think it was enough about the student as learner. And one of the things that, that, that concerns me is that learners come to a, uh, a, a university opportunity with certain aspirations and intentions and wishes and longer term desires. And what do they get from us? They get this package. And in order to make this package allegedly uh, systematic and efficient, we have wonderful concepts like constructive alignment, where we decide what the intended learning outcomes are. And then if you're um, to almost to quote John Biggs, we trap the student in this web of consistency around teaching and learning and assessment so that they actually can't escape without learning what we want them to learn. So it does seem to me there's an element about social justice that says, why is it that we're charging for something uh, and then saying it's got to be our way or not at all? So for me, um, a socially just higher education would give much more scope for students to, to bring in their own particular perspectives and attitudes and, and values that we make space for that within the curriculum building on that and and uh, i understand that everyone in the room probably understands this is the sense that our students aren't homogenous and so we can't assume where they've come from they're not and so that part of making online education work is being really explicit in expectations and how to achieve those things rather than you know falling for outdated tropes like digital natives and assuming that the students know what they're doing because it's an online online space so I think that that sense of knowing getting to know our students getting to know their varied backgrounds is you know the first step in ensuring that our education is socially just I, I'm uh, sorry I have to yeah, go for it. okay um so I want to turn a little bit to feedback um Amina because and, and um I, confession, I am supervising Amina's PhD, so I've got a little bit of skin in this game. Um, but um, I, I think that um, look, I, I think that any any act, as, as everyone's described, has social justice behind it. Education has to entail social justice. But there's something about feedback which lies between, you know, where I make comments about work that you've done, it positions people in certain ways in higher education. I hold the expertise and I'm I'm the standards and I comment comment. And I think I think the I, I I'm I think that is held within the structures that we have. And so I think a couple of things come in with that. One, I think we need to find means to 
push back against it. I don't think we'll erase it, but I think we can push back against it. And I think we can think about that quite explicitly online because in, in, in all circumstances, um, whether it be online or face-to-face, -face, sometimes we do things because they're easy and things slot in and I'm, you know, I accept teachers are over, overworked. But sometimes I think that that feedback exchange ought to be generative. That is, it should allow um, both the learner and the teacher to come to something that is new together. And I think Rolla might be in the audience. I mean, she talks about the co, the the co-construction. This this thing where actually through this, through a dialogue or through discussion of work, everyone learns something. And that, to me, I think is a means of starting to think about feedback in a way that doesn't that is more socially just because. If you position the teacher as as learner as well, then I think you can open up some of those some of those doors. Um, and in some some situations, I don't know whether it's appropriate, but I think we can we can make moves towards it. Thank you very much. Uh, if I just may add, although I'm here in the position of a moderator, I think that a good part of the answer to this question lies in the book's subtitle, which says "Beyond Technology." So I don't think that we can really just take postgraduate online education or whatever kind of education, doesn't really matter, and then just somehow add or glue the social justice aspect to it. I think that social just, uh, justice is something that needs to be embedded, it's something that needs to be uh, there interwoven by design, that it needs to be there at the beginning. Of course, we can adjust library times and things like that and provide online access and so on. But generally, online access is also not egalitarian and equal in many, many ways because people don't have, for, for many, many reasons, cannot access at this time, at that time, have problems with equipment, whatever. So the question is, I think, really, that, and, and that's why I find this book so important because it speaks a lot about social justice even when it doesn't explicitly mention the phrase social justice because it's kind of embedded at a much deeper level and this is something and this is something that i really enjoy and that i really appreciate about about the book but we've got five more minutes for this first panel and actually jen ross asked a very interesting question about research and i again need to use the opportunity and say that actually in the book series, we are now preparing a new book, which is specifically about post-digital research. So if you are interested, the call, the call of papers is still open, and now the link is the link is in the chat, so you can read the, the, the call for chapters, and it would, we would be delighted to have your contribution in this next book. But perhaps just to ask Jen to tell us what she meant by research and what she did with her comment question. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, it works. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the discussion so far. It's been fantastic. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about the kinds of questions and new practices and approaches that the book is kind of discussing and raising and that have been discussed just now and wondering, do we need to be thinking differently about how we go about researching these kinds of questions and issues. So, I mean, I obviously have a perspective on this because um, I'm really interested in speculative methods, but I think there's lots more different kinds of things we could be thinking about in this space. And I'm wondering what the panel thinks about this. Just um, see Karen nodding, but also after Karen, Sharon, if you've got anything to say, now's your chance. <laughs> Or, or please go, please go first, Sharon. Um, it's interesting because you mentioned, Karen, entanglement earlier, and that's one of the things that I'm looking at in my research, which um, Jen is supervising, so she has skin in this game too, so that works out quite well. Thank you, Jen. And um, that consideration of how do you acknowledge and recognise that entanglement comes into that research. So looking at different methods that in the past have been used. Um, one of the methods that I, I look at 
um, is the listening guide. And normally that looks at the, the person that you are interviewing, but how do you take it beyond to listen to the voices that are beyond that? And then that ties into that social justice aspect of who are the invisible voices that may be speaking around and as part of the that spilled out interconnected network, that relational um, connection that we have. So I think it ties in quite a lot to what Karen has been talking about, the importance of considering that relational um, approach to research, that we have that connection, that we have those, um, that awareness that we recognize, um, as Margaret said, about the teacher as learner and the student as learner and how we learn with each other and the uncertainty around that, which in itself is a skill and a strength that we have to develop, um, particularly when we're faced with so much uncertainty in our lives. Living with that uncertainty in the learning um, is interesting, which then ties into Dai's point about um, when we have something that is not consistent, life is not consistent. So if we take students in and say to them, this is the only way that you can learn, the only way you can research, it has to be done this way. It closes off all that development of strengths to deal with the, uncert the uncertainty and the uncertain spaces that we're in. So um, there needs to be quite a bit of, of play around, I think, with that and the strength to play and to try something out and to be willing to try it because it might work, it might not, but we won't know if we don't try. Um, and then I'll hand over to Karen. Thank you. Very yeah. much. Um, I definitely agree with that. I mean, I think there's a multiple of approaches and different methods that we can use, but you know, I'm, I, I really see the, the value in um, exploring playful, creative or arts informed methods, you know, methods that can enable us to ask new questions, I think can be really generative and um, also, you know, thinking with theory. So I have, you know, really found um, using theories, new materialism or socio-materialism really valuable. Um, and I think that I think those kinds of theories fit very well with the, the, the kinds of discussions that we're having today, because they socio-materialism, for example, enables us to to look very closely. Um, Leslie Gurley talks in her work about adopting a noticing stance. And it enables us to notice, you know, not just what people are doing, but but what what's technology doing? What what are the things that what are the things doing? You know, how is time? How is space? How are all of these actors involved in the learning interaction? So so I think there's a multiple of of um, directions that we can take, which is really exciting. I think um, for me, what's really exciting is thinking with theory in terms of thinking of, with post-digital theories. It sets us free from the types of research that look at the learnification of education. You know, what is, how much more does digital technology allow people to learn and to get into really interesting things like the social relationships that underpin the successful um, processes, the material conditions, the, the digital and the non-digital, those things that are often neglected. And I think that's that's really exciting that, that these theories allow us to kind of look at those things that are often hidden. Well, thank you very much, Rachel. I think that we will say that this was the wrap up for the session. Our timing has just expired at 10 minutes past 10. So I would like to thank all the speakers at the panel, Tim, Margaret, Sharon, Dai, Rachel, and Karen. And we will now move on to the second panel, which is vulnerability, care, and identity in online contexts. Before we move on, if anybody has any last questions or comments for this panel, please shoot now. So, and then we will just move on to the next one. Okay. So for the next panel, I would like to introduce our next bunch of panelists, which is Jilek Etkin, Maha Bali, Sonia Bassi, Charles Marley, Yugmi Lee and Katie Stone. So the same format like before, please introduce yourselves in a couple of minutes and then we will move on with the discussion. Jill, please. Hi everybody, um, I'm Jill Aitken. I'm the lead for postgraduate um, medical education at the medical school in Edinburgh. Um, so it's great to see so many of you here and um, I'm certainly enjoying the chat. Uh, Maha, would you like to go next, please? Thank you, Jill. Hi, everybody. I'm Maha Bailey. I am based in Cairo, Egypt. I work at the American University in Cairo, where my main job is at the Center for Learning and Teaching um, as an ed educational developer. 
And um, I'm also organizing a really interesting event this summer called the Midyear Festival, and I've got the link to that in the chat. Excellent, thank you very much. Sonia? I'm not sure that Sonia's here. Oh. I haven't seen her in the participants. So, oh, I see, oh, um, see. So let's move on to Charles. Yeah. Is Charles around? Hi, I'm I'm here. <laughs> Hi, Jeff. How are you doing, Jill? Um, yeah, I'm I'm Charles Marley. I'm a um, senior lecturer at the University of Adelaide. I work in the uh, School of Allied Health Science and Practice. But um, I'm only recently there. I used to work with Jill, Tim, um, Derek. In Edinburgh, um, in, in in medical school, um, whilst in Australia, interestingly. So yeah, I worked with them in Edinburgh from Adelaide. Um, before that, I worked in Edinburgh and uh, was program director of an online uh, psychology program. Thank you very much, uh, me Hello, um, nice to meet you and really nice to be here. I'm a senior lecturer at the University uh, of Lancaster and I teach on the program uh, called e uh, Technology and Learning and E-Research. So that doctoral program that we have um, our students from all around the world and doing the doctor for years with us uh, as a part time. So which kind of enabled me to write the chapter kind of reflecting upon my own teaching experiences. And that's my teaching is part of my research as well. Like I always try to make connection between two pretty closely and write a lot about it. Um, so good to uh, meet you all here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Kathy. Hi, everyone. I'm Kathy Stone. I'm, I'm in Australia, too, like a number of other people here. Um, I have an honorary appointment with the University of Newcastle, where Rachel is as well. I'm a conjoint associate professor with the School of Humanities and Social Science. I, I mainly do um, uh, consultancy and research work these days. And uh, before that, I worked for many, many years in, um, in the professional side of the university uh, at a couple of different places, working with on-campus students and online students in terms of student experience, student retention, student success, um, improving services for students and so on. And so my, my uh, work with online students particularly resonated with me because my background is very much in student equity and I could see the diversity of the student population that online allowed and encouraged. So that was a real eye opener for me and something I really enjoyed. So the chapter that uh, I wrote with my colleagues, Janet and Jill, came out of um, uh, some work that we had done together with the University of Tasmania, which is where they both were at the time. And the University of Tasmania has a very diverse student population and a great deal of online learners. And of course, we did all this post pandemic, the work that we were doing there. And uh, yeah, it was just, um, I think it was out of that and seeing just um, how, how I suppose online opens up possibilities for so many students who wouldn't otherwise be able to go to university that, uh, yeah, I, I think that's, that's where my, my passion lies. So we're really pleased to be able to write this chapter uh, for the book um, uh, through Tim and, and, and Jill. And um, so, uh, yeah, so that, that's me, I'll stop there. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. We managed to introduce five people in four minutes, which is just amazing because it leaves us a lot of time for discussion. So yeah, let's start. Uh, there's, been, there's been a lot of talk in the previous panel about, about the, this uh, social justice and stuff, which is kind of also a theme of this panel as well. So perhaps if, if you could start from, from there. Um, I'm happy to to kick things off and we'll, and Maha I'll come to you next if that's okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I, just to bring it back to um, I, who raised the issue of um, that originally, um, but a big problem for us, um, particularly um, in Edinburgh and probably at other bigger institutions in the UK. Um, Susan, you can maybe chip you can chip in as well from your experiences in Glasgow. Are the fees? that are imposed on us as online postgraduate programs that really um, cut out about, I'd say 95% of the world's population being able to afford to study on these um, 
uh, these courses. So that's a major problem for equity, which I think is such a shame because really these programmes are, in my opinion, primed to be um, vehicles for um, philanthropy for big academic institutions and opening up education to everybody. So I think it's it's a real problem and it's something that I don't know that we have the answer to. Certainly what we do is any surplus fee income, we recycle it as scholarships and offer it to people that can't afford the fees, but that's only because we run a big program with a lot of income. So um, it's it's a difficult issue to, to, to deal with. Um, Maha, did you want to come in on that topic as well? So, so I was going to say something else, but in response to what you were saying, I think um, you know different people are defining social justice slightly in different ways, and your response seems to focus a lot more on the financial aspects, the economic aspect. But I like Nancy Fraser's model that also looks at cultural and political elements of social justice. So, of course, and even actually when we talk about the economic um, costs of learning that are unequally distributed, it's not just the fees that people pay. There's also sort of the opportunity cost of spending time learning versus caring for kids or getting uh, having a full-time job or even the mental health aspect of trying to do everything, which I guess a lot of mothers, especially and single parents do. Um, but I was, I was originally, I mean, since our, our, um, our theme is about vulnerability, I think a lot of discourses around vulnerability are all about encouraging that because it's good for the, for the group and for the socio-emotional well-being of everyone. And I think we sometimes forget that we're not all equally vulnerable or equally fragile. And Bell Hooks talks about how important it is to, our, as teachers, make ourselves vulnerable first before we ask our students to be vulnerable. And I think some of the chapters show that in the, in the book. Um, but also we still have more power with the teachers, you know, already we have a lot of power. And so we shouldn't be expecting everyone to equally be willing to be vulnerable. And there was a chapter also in the book about hospitality and some colleagues and I developed a notion called intentionally equitable hospitality and to recognize that whatever we think um, is what's gonna make people feel welcome and willing to share will differ for different people. Um, and so in terms of equity, uh, and someone was writing also about, about you know, how do you do policies and, and so on. And I think one of the important elements of, of thinking about equity and care together is, is the fact that we need to be sure that the care that we give is not paternalistic care, where we assume we know what people need and do that for them. And we assume that vulnerability is good for them or storytelling and sharing. And that we always ask how much agency do do the, the the less powerful people in the room, the more marginalized people in the room have to decide what, how much they want to share and what they want to share um, and so on. I'm going to link to a thing. I would, I would, I absolutely agree with you. I, I would just like to mention that when speaking specifically about post digital, uh, sorry, post graduate education, in places like the UK, I mean, those programs are actually the biggest cash cows. And the thing is that, I mean, the university may, may, do make money on undergraduate programs as well, but nothing like, like, like masters, for instance, with so many foreign students and so on. So the question is here, uh, I mean, I totally agree that we shouldn't focus on money because there's so many factors involved that we shouldn't uh, single out any of these, especially the financial one. But in this case, I think it is a prominent issue because this is, these are the programs which are probably the most expensive and the most uh, revenue bringing into, into, into universities. And I think that that's, that's, it's, it's an important thing to emphasize. Now, I'm not sure what we can do about it. I mean, I'm from the position of people who work at universities, but I think that we should definitely talk about it and that we should definitely emphasize this fact that actually those programs are probably some of the most extortionate programs that there are. Uh, oh, sorry, I was just going to follow on from that. I mean, I, the issue is, I think, that if, if you can't afford to come, then everything else is moot, isn't it? <laughs> um, so if that's not right, then um, if the fees aren't right, then it's a massive, massive issue. Um, certainly in our institution, all students, irrespective of where they live, pay the same fees. So that's 
on one hand possibly good but equally um it's challenging but uh, you're right i think we have to we have to influence the narrative in our own institutions about the potential pedagogical value of these types of programs where where the the, the narrative it, at the institutional level is very much as susan said um on income they just see money um, and that's a, that's a real problem. So I think it comes back to Jen's earlier comment about um, the research. There's an onus on us as a group, as a as a collective, to actually write about what we're doing and the value and the impact of that, um, because I think that's not always seen more widely. I, think, um, I, I add something to that. So the the, um, the financial aspect is interesting because you have obviously fees and been able to attend, but there's a tension also on program or certainly I felt this tension uh, as a program director to um, pay attention to costs and to you know so that we're talking about upscaling and all that kind of stuff so bringing in more students but also the way in which we deliver teaching and you know kind of the pastoral support and care to the students you know so the way that I ran things was trying to create a sort of an inclusive environment where everybody was able to access me and all that kind of stuff whereas I felt I always had to sort of fight to continue that and was receiving pressure from elsewhere to not do that and to run a more sort of streamlined system in line with the way that we ran uh, the sort of the support systems for face-to-face uh, -face students. But it didn't work for online students because, you know, you weren't able to bump into them in the corridors and all that kind of stuff. So that a, new, a, a completely different system was required. But I was always having to fight to maintain that. So, and that was always a cost thing in the sort of like the coded language was, you know, we need to run a sort of a bronze star kind of service and all that kind of stuff and make them feel like it's, it's gold star. You know, so the pressure to kind of cut costs and to pay attention to costs was there, even for the students who were able to pay the fees to attend. So it, it's a big, big issue, I would say. Thank you very much. Uh... Anybody else from the panel, perhaps? Uh, I was just typing uh, furiously while I was going to say. Um, I don't know. For me, yeah, being free, I, mean, I, I totally agree with tuition issues, but I'm pretty much with Charles uh, in a way that I think it's, we should see it as a spectrum rather than one being free and one being too expensive. I think we have to focus on us being able to offer something online and like all the things that we actually enable students to sustain. So I think when they talk about tuition, actually students have so much more broad, and pers broad perspective than us because they really calculate our students are not just passive learner they're like active kind of they really calculate every single penny that they're spending and earning and then all the things that they can get and overall I think what we do as the online you know, postgraduate educator I think we should be um, happy about what we're doing in a way that because a lot of our students actually they see many things that we do enable them to Although they pay tuitions, but all the things that they still get, it's often higher. That's why they made a decision to do it with us. So only thing that I think for me to focus is rather than worrying too much about tuition they pay, um, I think for me, most heartbreaking thing is that students spent like four or five years paying the tuition and didn't get the PhD and left eventually because of I, I, that's really bad for me. So for me, only thing that in our position, what we can do as a tutor, a tutor team, really support and then provide this structure and good balance between structure and flexibilities for our students to actually get something, you know, much uh, valuable for their money. I think that's more a kind of productive conversation that I would often do with my colleagues. Um, so thanks. Yeah, can I can I tag just, on? Can I tag on to Kim? Yeah, sure, please. Just really quickly, as someone who was a PhD student in, in the UK, as an international student who was remote, missing all of those corridors, uh, and I, I had, and never mind, we're not talking about supervisors, but since they're not here, but um, yeah, there there was of course much less support than if I was even there. But I, that was a point I was kind of making. That. It's good to, of course, provide the financial access, but it's really important when you get the access to get that support. Uh, it's easy to get into a UK PhD versus a US PhD. It's really hard to finish it. It took me seven years. I had a baby and a revolution and I had a lot of things happening in the middle. And I thought I would finish in like four years and I paid a lot of money. <laughs> and it, yeah, very horrible for the ones who come in and they don't finish. And so it's some people need to focus on the money, but we still shouldn't ignore all the other things and the ways in which 
Um, yeah. Academia is a lot of gatekeeping and the keeping means that we are forced to write in particular ways. We are forced to research in particular ways in our own cultures. And what we have to offer is not taken into consideration. And what I really liked about Kumi's um, chapter is that she was talking about how she redesigned her course to focus on autoethnography. And it's such an empowering way of designing the course and helping the students and supporting them in a, in a more longer term way than the way the course was taught before. And I think we need to redesign the way we do um, PhD programs. Mine was a completely research degree. There were no courses. I met no other students, you know? And that kind of peer support even, I didn't have, I didn't, I would like knock on other professors' doors when I visited Sheffield, but I only had access to my supervisor by email throughout the year, you know, so. Yeah, I was just going to really second what everyone's saying, that it's that relationship that's so important to students. And certainly in Australia, and I, I, I don't know if it's the same in the UK and in other countries, but a very high proportion of students who study online at postgraduate level as well as undergraduate are studying part-time. A higher proportion are, tend to be part-time because they're, you know, they're still working, they're still looking after their families, so they're studying part-time as well. And certainly it's the case here that part-time study is a risk in itself of higher attrition. So even in the on-campus environment, students who are part-time are more likely to drop out than students who are full-time, and that's just the, the statistics on it. So when they're studying part-time and online, which is very, very common, um, and, and they're paying you know, postgraduate fees, then they, they are very much at risk. And what keeps them there, and what students will say time and again, is it's the relationships. And that's generally speaking, the relationships with their tutors, their lecturers, that are so, so important to them. And there may be other support services. And, you know, in, 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 in a previous life, I was responsible for managing and, and, and um, implementing so many of those other support services. But these students, you know, they've got their heads down. They're just focusing on their, their coursework or their research because they've got their jobs and their kids and all the rest of it as well. They haven't got time to hunt around the website to find out if they can see a council or if they can go to learning support or something like that online. Uh, so it, it, it is, and I'm not saying that those services aren't useful, they are, but it's much going to be much more valuable if they have that relationship with their tutors, their lecturers, and that they can say to them, look, I think you'd benefit from going along to this um, workshop that the library's having, online workshop on research methods, and then they're likely to go. So it, it comes back to that relationship. So I, I, I really believe in all the research that I've done, all the contact I've had with students over many years, both you know, in a research capacity and just in a day-to-day -day working capacity, that it's that that's crucial. And, and I know I'm preaching to the converted here because you all think the same, but um, you know, I just want to agree with you all that that's really what is crucial, that relationship. I would just like to say that when Maka was talking, at, at one point, Maka, you said, I had the baby and the revolution, which is really sounds like a good title for a chapter or something, because it really illustrates all the different things that happen to people during the course of the studies. And it's, uh, I mean, it's amazing what can happen to people in these few years of life, and especially in the, in the age we live now from pandemics, wars, whatever. I mean, really, all those things happen. But I was, I'm interested really in concordances. I'm trying to kind of look at what happened in these various sessions. And in the first session, we had a lot of talk about top-down organization of online learning. And then in the second, and, and now in this session now, Maha mentioned the paternalistic aspect of the, of, of, of online education and really uh, and the question kind of in both cases was agency. But then, uh, the, sorry, the answer was kind of in both cases was agency. But when we speak about agency, we didn't really say what we mean by this agency, how, how those things could progress from there. It's kind of a blanket answer for everything, but what does it really mean? So perhaps if somebody could comment, maybe Maha or somebody else would do. Yeah. I can start. That's a really good question because I grew up, I didn't grow up in Egypt. Uh, I grew up somewhere else. But uh, in Egypt, people grow up never questioning authority, never being given choices. So you give them agency and they have no idea what am I going to do with all these choices? I don't even know 
you know, how to think critically about making my decisions. So, of course, when we talk about agency, as in, you know, having giving someone the power to decide how they want to learn, where they want to learn, uh, their pace, their approach, and so on, if they have no idea, they don't know even what to mimic or what to copy, and they want an authority to tell them how to do this. And so, even though I'm a little bit more critical than that, when my supervisor would give me feedback, I would think, oh, I have to do what my supervisor said, until at some point he said, by the way, you don't have to do everything I tell you, it's just my opinion, you could argue back. And I realized that I was done with my PhD when I resisted what he was saying. I'm like, no, I'm not gonna make that change. I think this chapter is good enough. I'm gonna submit my thesis. I don't care what you think anymore. Um, and uh, and yeah, I did really well. But um, yeah, this this I think agency needs uh, sometimes for, for audiences that are not used to it or students that are not used to it, we need to sort of scaffold it a little bit and, and get in gently take you know what they can like with i mean like we do i don't mean to say this but like with children you give them a little bit of control if they've never done it before they need to watch someone do it they need to understand the choices they have because what we know is that people sometimes reproduce their own oppression because they've internalized that this is their space in the world or i i've internalized that westerners know how to do this better so maybe i should all or always read western sources of information never read local sources of information never read in arabic because the scholarship in arabic is not very valuable it's the language academic scholarship in those big peer-reviewed journals so there's how much are we willing as academics honestly to question that and then in what ways might we harm students also if we allow them to go that far and then they go out into the academic world and then they're not being accepted so there's the challenging the hegemony but recognizing where the power is and so you need students to both be critical and also recognize that actually even if i encourage you to do this in the real world there are places that won't accept autoethnographic research for example um, so Thank you very much. Any other panelists, perhaps, or somebody else? Um, if I can, uh, I, when I think about agency, I always think about in line with uh, structure as well. So I think at the end of the day, I do believe all my students have agency. It's not that they don't have, that I have to empower them. I don't only think that I am in position of empowering anyone to use their agency, but uh, what I, so often I see it as the tension between agency and then what kind of change they can actually make in the program or in my course. I think that's kind of more practical way for me to see if I'm or my students are actually fulfilling or kind of utilizing their agency to a certain extent. Um, so when it comes to, I agree with Maha in terms of what when it comes to the knowledge they want to study and then topic they want to research, all those choices that can do within the module, uh, how much they can make a choice within their own. Um, the kind of remit that I offer as a tutor or program, I think that's where uh, I think I can uh, construct the students' uh, agency. And so if they can't make any choices or can they, they can't push any structure already put in place, I think unfortunately that we're not doing well in terms of encouraging and empowering students' agency. That's how I see, although it's not pretty clear answer in terms of definition, but I've just tried to uh, illustrate how I see that. Well, thank you very much. We've got five minutes until the end of this session. And I would like to uh, invite the corridor people to tell us a few things because I immediately remembered the book written by my old friend, Peter McLaren, Christ from the Corridor. And we've got a lot of discussion about online corridors in, in, in the chat. So I'm not really sure. I mean, it seems that different people uh, use the phrase with slight, slightly different meaning perhaps or something. So I would like to, if you could just clarify this a bit, what this online corridor would actually be and what its purpose would be and how how it really works. And it's, uh, it's just something new that popped up. So I would really like to hear a few words about it, if that's okay. Who's, who started it? I think it might be me, accidentally. Uh, well then. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what I was, I mentioned it in the comments. So I was, I started online teaching quite a long time ago. I had no experience of it and was kind of tasked with putting together an online program <laughs> and put one together, but I sort of developed over time thinking of, you know, how do we, how do we connect? How do we, how do we, you know, as a group, students and teachers connect and, and talk and you know we were given sort of technology to use certain technologies like you know black 
um, collaborate, I think, was the one. It didn't really work very well. So it was kind of, let's, how do we work out? How do we make this connection? And I think always in the back of my head, I just had this idea that somehow we should be able to just bump into each other when we need to and let, you know, kind of chat when we need to. And, you know, so not having these sort of formal spaces and, you know, like tutorials and all that kind of stuff, it needed to extend beyond that. I suppose I had in my head this idea of, you know, the, the, the programme being within a university um, and being, you know, within a school and the, and the library connected that into the union and, and all these places where people moved through and sort of bumped into each other and talked to each other. And I just had that idea in my head about how to build that sort of um, space into an online programme. And it, yeah, I didn't really know how to make that happen. So we tried different things and then sort of, you know, encourage students to be part of that and try out new things with us. And, and we just ended up keeping the things that worked and getting rid of the things that didn't. But I think simply at the center of it was this idea that we should be able to talk to each other when we need to, um, not just within this teaching, you know, time. It was trying to create something more informal and bigger, I think. So that was, that was, that was what was in my head. And yeah, I, I don't know if it was successful or not, but it certainly built relations between students and myself and the group, and it seemed to it seemed to work for us. Um, and I think that that's what I mean by the on the corridor, bumping into each other, creating opportunities to talk um, as much as possible. I think one space. Well, first of all, I sometimes call them third places, uh, and that kind of aligns with other literature on like just places where people bump into each other. And I think a place like semi-synchronous spaces like Slack and Discord, where sometimes people will meet at the same time, sometimes not. So you're not planning when to meet, but when people are together, it feels synchronous. And then if someone comes in later, they can catch up and continue the conversation. I think they create that kind of space. Uh, Tim is asking if using uh, corridors and water cooler and so on, offline metaphors, do they get in the way of imagining? That's a good point. I think the those give us a feeling of how it feels. Um, and then I think when I said Slack, that look at all like a corridor or water cooler or anything but it's and this semi-synchronicity is something that I think doesn't exist offline at all right you're either synchronous or you're not at the same in the same place at the same time um so that's sort of what I'm thinking but it's so so important for these spaces sometimes to be created by the students themselves and not by the teachers or the teachers to create them and not be there so back in 2003 when I did my master's online we had a space called the cafe discussion forum on WebCT. And of course, it's completely asynchronous, but through that, we would meet each other and say, hey, do you want to get on a conversation with me? But it was a space that the teachers never came, and it was ours, and that, I think, matters a lot. Thank you very much. We've got one minute for any last comments. Anybody from the from the panel, perhaps, would like I, to I'll just, wrap this there's up? A question, there's a question in the chat that was... Um, that Tim's asking, did, did the idea of informal chat come up in my research? And um, I was just, I was thinking about that as everyone was talking. And, you know, in my experience, I've done a lot of research with students studying online. They do create their own ways of informally chatting. It's usually through things like Facebook and sometimes WhatsApp groups and things like that. But they do, they create it and, um, and they find it very important. And I know that, you know, pre-pandemic, there was often this attitude that um, somehow that wasn't a good thing. They were creating these Facebook groups that because, we, you know, we didn't quite know what they were talking about. And, you know, were they getting it all wrong in terms of, you know, understanding the academic content if they're just talking among themselves. But, you know, I think nowadays there's a view that however they communicate, that's great to have that uh, contact with peers, with other students. But, but yes, it, it has come up qu quite a bit and the importance to students of creating that space. And one of the interesting things that I found in some research I did recently is that those spaces are most productive when they also have a really good relationship with their tutor or lecturer. So where you've got a class, a, a cohort that's working really well with their tutor or lecturer and they feel cared about and they feel like they belong in that class, then the chat on the Facebook is much more productive. Whereas if, if they're not happy in that class, if they they, 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 they don't get the feedback, they don't feel that the tutor or the lecturer is really paying much attention to them, then the Facebook chat is full of complaints about the course. So it's not very productive. So they're, they're the sorts of things that I've found that that is important to students. It's often really important for them to do it themselves, but important for that to be encouraged, to explicitly encouraged. Thank you very much.
I think that we will take this as a, as a wrap up for this uh, second panel as well. So I would like to thank all the panelists, which were Jill, Maha, Charles, Kingme, and Katie. Now we will have a 10 minute break, after which we will resume with the third panel and then with the wrap up and wind down. So please take your time. There's, it's a 10 minute break. You can continue the discussion if you want informally. Let's create a little corridor here so we can actually do. So for this next 10 minutes, you can use and, 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 and the corridor in whatever way you feel like. Thank you very much. And I'll see you at uh, 10.50 UK time.
How are you, Sarah? Getting there, I think. Don't know where. <laughs> <laughs> Taking time off is a dangerous thing, isn't it? I come back and don't know what to do first. But it's lovely to see you all, and I'm so enjoying this morning. Yeah, me too. It's such a treat. How are you doing? Good. I, I'm. Um, I, it was a funny thing because I've been looking forward to the book launch for, you know, months now because it was going to happen, I think, in February. And then, um, hi, Thomas. And then it kind of got put off and it went under the radar and back up and were people still going to be able to do it and be interested? And then um, because of the way we set it up, I don't really have to do anything, which is weird as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Peppa. Well, I'm not doing much as well. It's, Thanks, it's, Sinead. It's just so many people coming with their own ideas and thoughts, and it's just wonderful. So I think that we will slowly close the corridor in about a minute and start with introductions of our panelists for the third panel, which is about examining the post-digital curriculum. So again, just to reiterate for those people who just joined us, we are discussing, we are now discussing the book, uh, and it's not really, about presenting, but about just uh, covering some thoughts and ideas that come out of the book and actually move beyond the book and to see how the book has inspired our thinking in various, various directions. So there we go. I think we, should, we are about to start. I would like to introduce our third panel, which is uh, on examining the political curriculum uh, Derek Jones, Thomas Ryberg, Christine Sinclair, and Sarah Hayes. So if you could just introduce yourself in a minute or two, and then we can move on. Derek, the floor is yours. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I, until last August, worked with Jill and Tim and others present at this meeting on the Masters in Clinical Education at the University of Edinburgh. Um, I say I was employed rather than I'm now retired because over the course of this panel, um, I've decided to stop using the word retired and call myself a post-academic instead, because uh, along with Di and others here, I'm sure um, if I'm retired, what am I doing here? <laughs> uh, why am I still engaging these kinds of events? Why have uh, Jill and Tim managed to persuade me to come back and teach a course over this, this last semester? So there you go. So I wanted to challenge the idea of retirement as an academic, uh, and that goes on with the general theme of this, is what, what does it mean to be post, um, and how do we apply that to other things? So, um, yeah, that's all what we want to say for now. Well, thank you very much, sorry. Uh, the next person will be Thomas. Yes, thank you, Peter, and thank you for a lovely uh, presentation, Derek. I'm not sure how to top the post-academic. I'm just an academic, I suppose. Uh, I'm a professor in PBL and Digital Learning in Albany University, and I'm also director of a new institute for advanced study in, in problem-based learning that was recently uh, initiated in Albany University, 1st of January. So, And I just realized since COVID broke out, I've been to two different uh, positions. I took up a new professorship and then this directorship and 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 it's just thinking about nothing had really happened in my academic life for 17 years. I've been in the same positions and suddenly uh, a lot of changes happened uh, in a very short time. So that's that's something maybe to come back to. And, um, but, but just briefly say that, um, yes, I'm the director of this Institute for Advanced Study in, in PBO. Thank you very much, Christine. Hello, I, I'm another post-academic um, and have been for four years. My, my husband, if I say I'm, I'm going to be working today, he says, Christine, you're retired, you're volunteering. But uh, uh, I think I like post-academic uh, better. So I was the uh, programme director for the MSc in digital education before I retired in 2018 at, at the University of Edinburgh. 
uh, and it's lovely to, to still maintain contacts with the lovely people there, including Tim, uh, and Tim and I wrote the chapter um, on evaluation and trying to thicken the descriptions around course evaluation and pro curriculum evaluation. Thank you very much. And Sarah? Thanks, Peter. Um, yes, hi everyone. I'm Sarah Hayes. I'm a, a professor in higher education policy in the Education Observatory Research Centre, which is based at Wolverhampton, although I'm very rarely there. I'm certainly virtual. I can't say I'm yet post-academic, but uh, there's days when I'm thinking <laughs> seriously about it. But it's nice to know that if you do uh, do become post-academic, you, uh, you can never leave. So um, <laughs> I think I've been involved with Peter and the, the work of the post-digital journal from the start along with the others and uh, this, this book series has been brilliant and uh, I'd like to thank um, Tim, Jill and Derek for involving me in the, uh, the chapter that I was uh, writing for this. Um, and also just to say that I think it's been uh, fascinating to listen to people talking so far um, in the different panels just about um, raising the visibility of, of the type of work that um, you know, uh, all the different um, aspects of this. So really looking forward to our discussion just now. And um, thanks very much, uh, Peter and Tim, for putting it together. Well, thanks very much. Thank you very much, everybody, for your introductions. We managed to do them again in four minutes, which is amazing. So we got a lot of time for discussion. Uh, it's interesting in those dialogical sessions when things happen when you don't really expect them. So when people introduce themselves, you wouldn't expect, you would just expect people to say a few words about but, uh, themselves. But actually the notion of post-academic, I'm, really I'm really interested in this notion. So can you perhaps kick off the discussion about what, how, when, when do you stop being, even I, who am an active academic, so I'm not a retired or post-academic, but I'm, an, I'm an, an academic at work and then in home I'm, what a father, a household member, uh, and many things probably. So when do I start being a post-academic and just cease to be an academic? Or is it like the post-digital that you never actually stop and post doesn't mean after, but means something else? Should we perhaps start with this? Yeah, that, that, that's exactly what I had in mind because I was thinking about this in relation both to the idea of post-curriculum is that it's, it's got elements of what's gone before it, but also what's coming up ahead and what's happening in the now. So it's, it's very complex thing in the same way as being an academic. And, and, and using that title academic is a, a challenging one because when we think about our daily working lives and when we think about the efforts of our trade unions to, to fully reimburse us for the work that we do, it's difficult to think in terms of well, you know, there's a 36 hour working week and you don't stop working at 36 hours, but equally the very nature of your job and your interest in being an academic is not, all oh, right, it's five o'clock, I'm gonna stop thinking now. So you're always thinking about stuff. Uh, and even as, uh, you know, so whether, whether you're an employed, an employee of an institution, you're always on in some ways, you're always looking out for little things and that's probably always been the case, but it's become particularly the case now as um, the, with, with the neoliberal university and the diversification of job titles. So, you know, e-teachers, e e-developers, um, academic support staff, where institutions attempt to tie down what a post is and how many work hours are, are associated with it and so on and so forth. We see exactly the same kind of processes in operation with the curriculum as we try and tie this learning experience down and say, you know, it, it lasts for 36 hours. These are the topics that will be covered. Uh, and this is what you will learn. And at the end of this, this is what, what the output is. So I think that the whole, and, and I think this is what I took from, very much from uh, Christine and, and Sarah's, um, paper on the work of post is, is that really highlights that, that using this term post applies to lots of different situations and draws our attention to the complexities and the challenges around how we name things that, that we do 
Um, so yeah, that's where I was going, and, and it's only really just crystallised over, over the course of this event in my mind that this, you know, the the value of 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 this work that post can do. So. And I like the way you used that in in your chapter about curriculum. Post curriculum is a, a a nice idea. We've still got a lot to say about curriculum because it's not one straightforward thing. And there is an interesting temporality in the curriculum. Unlike many others, unlike many other things that we do in the academia, curricula are actually very much forward-looking. And this is this is what I always found very interesting about curricula and this idea that something that's done today has impacts five, ten, or twenty years in the future. And this 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 temporal aspect is really fascinating, yeah. particularly when you look at the processes. Because I'm sure many of us here have been members of validation panels where people have produced um, programs that that come up for review. Very rarely will those things have be absolutely brand new. You're always building on something that's gone before. Uh, but as you say, Petty, you also you know this 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 validation is good for at least five years if not more by the time the last cohort start a program and work forward. So that temporal dimension to curriculum is always building on the past, is constructed in the present with current circumstances and, and constraints, but also will have an impact far into the future as well. This is a very, very nice thought. Someone once told me when I was, I was writing um, material about uh, curriculum development that I needed to be very clear about the difference between course development, curriculum development, and curriculum development was something haggled over in high places, um, with the implication it being not really something that the likes of me should be involved with at all. <laughs> and then, but um, when I started to think about it, I I realized some people would say curriculum design is the same as course design. Um, and some of my students, when I was teaching course design, we discovered that not only the curriculum is in course distinctions difficult, but what a course was in all these students' minds, and this was postgraduate online students, varied from a 20 minute drill and practice to um, a three-year program, what we called a program. Um, and all of those uh, different students would, would have, and I, when I started as a student myself on the, um, on the same MSc, uh, I thought what, what they were calling courses, I was calling modules because that's what we used at Strathclyde where I was at the time. So it's a very complex area just what you call things. I was going to agree with you there, Christine, on just the, the language, I think, is mm. it can be pretty off-putting. And Maha just, and apologies, Maha, my text earlier of spelling your name wrong, but um, the, um, you know, the language can be really off-putting and, and stops us maybe discussing these things. So she's, she's put that, you know, we don't discuss curriculum enough, and I don't think we do because we kind of expect that people know about these things. But there's a huge amount to delve into and try and try to get at critically and to to change maybe there, you know, and um, particularly the language part of it, if it's, you know, is yeah. causing misunderstandings. I think this this post gives us a critical point at least to to come in and look at it afresh, doesn't it? I particularly like the point that it sort of seemed that the, the post also indicated a past and a, and a present and a future uh, kind of entangled in each other. I really like that idea and it made me think of of, of your wonderful uh, uh, figure, uh, uh, Tim, about an entangled pedagogy uh, and, and what we're working towards kind of thinking about is aspirational. What what do we want to value? Where do we see ourselves in in, in in a few years, what are, what are the values we want to underpin uh, education? I'm, I'm thinking I really like values to, to, to become more uh, prominent within uh, our own curriculum development and, and more so more, more generally. I think that was so, so thanks for bringing up those thoughts. Can 
Can I just make a naughty comment about values? Because um, there's a lot of pushing in UK um, of particular values that are imposed in universities. And you know there may be good intentions behind them, but Peter and I have just written an article about this. And uh, it does seem to be there is a, a, a sort of, you know, a logo and then there's a framework and then there's a set of values. And we've noticed that people are being asked to live the university's values. And I think that's important to think about the kind of values you might be talking about, um, Thomas, because, you know, as Maha says, there's the, um, you know, the hidden curriculum going on. There's the, you know, there's these invisible things that are happening and getting the chance to talk about what we're really meaning and whether or not we should be adopting only this set of values as opposed to other cultural values or other important personal values. I'm not sure if um, others have thoughts on that one. Love it if you can stun people into silence that way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just seeing that Tim's, uh, Tim's collaring uh, Derek for, for something. I think that people are just being polite, really. I mean, there's so much, there's so much going on there, especially, especially in terms of values. And actually, I'm surprised that values was not the first word that somebody mentioned when when we started speaking about talking about the curriculum. But 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 what I what I wonder about those values really is, for me, I mean, obviously they kind of come through these. Uh, institutional processes like uh, some sorts of uh, strategy development and so on processes which should theoretically be democratic but practically are really not and in the past in the last two sessions we also had this we also had this tension between uh, so between top down paternalistic agency stuff so i wonder when do we where do we really locate this agency for within 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 curriculum development i mean when we if we talk explicitly about values or not or how do we how do we negotiate those values of ours with values of institutions and then with values of more generally wow yeah that's that's a, that's a very very difficult question i think look looking into what what's happening in, in sorry in, in Auburn university at the moment is that until 2026 we're becoming a mission driven university which means we're yeah. responding to missions uh and that that's that's something that comes from 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 the top management but but also something that we need to grasp from below because i think what, and I, it was really a good point sarah whose values are we actually responding to here and and i think that would be the struggle uh and and in, in curriculum development and education to really and that's why i think discussing values and saying whose values are they because of course mission driven uh, can be seen as one thing to help solve climate trouble or uh poverty but it can also be seen as a way to uh impose a, a, a neoliberal curriculum uh, working with companies and so there are so many i mean different tensions in play when we start to, to, to work with this and then and and i guess that's also why i like Sims and Tangle Pedagogy, uh, that, that there are so many interests in this and, and how do we make visible what are the different vested interests and how do we come to discuss those interests, I think will be crucial in the years to come. Yeah, there's a lot of things going around in my head at the moment, so I apologize for the rather garbled expression of those ideas but one of them there which, which was prompted by something Thomas was saying was about the management and the university and the values of the university and it's almost like sometimes in the same way as we as teachers feel depersonalized when institutions talk about courses will produce this or courses will deliver that or the curriculum will result in that we, we talk about the management and, and maybe one of the, the tactics that we can start doing is trying to identify who it is that are behind these things. So is, is it, you know, um, Stefan or Stephanie, the, the vice chancellor? So these are the vice chancellor's principles or who's leading that working group that has produced that or who's responsible for signing off that document. So this is so-and-so's policy rather than the university's policy. 
And once we've identified those individuals, then we can begin to think about, well, if it, it's Stefan or Stephanie who's come up with that, what, what levers can we pull that will, will have some influence on Stefan or Stephanie to change that rather than how can we get management to change that? If we know that that person responds to this kind of approach, uh, interpersonal interaction, then, then we can use that, that approach. And if somebody else responds better to written email conversations rather than phone calls, then we, we have email conversations with them. But, but that comes back to this pitch, this, this thing that's been run throughout the, the whole morning is this structure agency, the sort of classic um, discussion within sociological fields about is it structure or is it agency? Is, is it a mix, mixture of both? And always at the end of the day, it comes down to interactions between individuals. And once you've got those interactions between individuals, then the opportunity for dissent and disruption and, and messing around with things, fiddling with locks and so on and so forth becomes apparent. And it's not the case that the structures of these impersonal things that determine us, they constrain us. And equally, it's not the case that our interactions produce these, these structures. It's this back and forth between the two of them. And understanding that helps us, I think, to consider ways in which we can have an influence or impact on what happens to us. We can choose what to ignore. We can choose what to, um, you know, just just go ahead and do something and wait till somebody tells us off for, for having done something that we shouldn't have done and all those kinds of things. So it's, it's about, you know, being, being flexible with the rules, shall we say, a bit not quite Boris Johnson-esque, but um, for, for, you know, people in the UK will know what I'm talking about there, but, you know, if the r- rules are there to be um, bent, if not actually broken. That's an interesting point. Uh, coming from the post-academic, I really like it. <laughs> I... Yeah, it's much easier breaking the rules, I guess, when you're a post-academic than being an academic. So. <laughs> but, but I guess in many ways, curriculum is always, um, I mean, that's a verification of certain thoughts, but what's happened beneath the cu- curriculum, how courses are actually playing out is probably also much more uh, in negotiation and, and changes from what is actually written uh, in the curriculum, I think. It is possibly a bit dangerous to, to say this in, in public, but I think as, as a programme, we were always quite good at bending the rules to the maximum extent uh, and, and part of that was the realization and the power that came from actually bringing a lot of money to the institution so that i think that gave us a, a bit more leeway than perhaps some other programs that maybe didn't have the same high numbers of students uh, because we you know the management were, were confident that you know they're doing a good job. They're bringing in the students. They're bringing in the money. They're not causing us any problems. You know, let let them get on with it. We've other things to worry about rather than what the MSc in clinical education is doing. So that gave us a degree of, of freedom. So again, it's, it's this balance between you need to have some power to play with. You need to have some currency to be able to manage a situation. Um, and and. Very often that currency means that, yeah, we'll go along with the increase in student numbers because it will bring in lots of money. But that also gives us certain freedoms, like being able to offer scholarships from the programme to, to people who, who couldn't afford to come up otherwise. This post-academic uh, honesty is just amazing. I really enjoy it. <laughs> but but I, want, I wanted to ask something about, because it's when you were talking about this, I immediately had it in mind. Yeah, when I'm in my classroom, I'm very, very, very autonomous and free to do pretty much whatever I want to regardless of the curriculum. But in online classrooms, it's, it's a bit different because things are much easier to trace, which are, things are much easier to document. Uh, it's much, much easier to, unless I'm just talking on video, and even, even in that case, it's very, it's simply much, I mean, we, by implementing certain tools such as learning management systems, we definitely, as teachers and students, become much more susceptible to things such as surveillance. So how do we so how do we negotiate those things, this traditional freedom of bending the curriculum in your classroom with 
those post-digital twists in this freedom when you cannot really bend or you can or you're not sure whether you can do something or not because you don't know what the consequences will be and who will see it and who will respond to it and who will react to it. It's an interesting question, the one about surveillance. Um, so I, before I moved into an academic context, I was working as an occupational therapist in the National Health Service. Um, we had to collect all of this data every week on the number of patient interactions that we would have, what we were doing with patients and how long those, those sessions were and so on and so forth. And, and the general sort of uh, frustration and annoyance with this, that all this data would go off somewhere and certainly as far as we knew, nothing would ever happen with it. So although the potential for learning management system exists to have that kind of surveillance, I suspect that actually very little is happening with it unless somebody makes a deliberate and conscious decision to go and look at it. And they need some motivation to do that. And then that motivation needs to be seen in the context of other priorities. So it's like, oh yeah, this, this is what's important for us now. We've got all that data, uh, but we're not gonna actually do anything with it. It's, it's an idea that somebody had is that, oh yeah, you could go in and you could look at X, Y, and Z. Um, but it's only if that, became a relevant thing to do, that somebody would actually do that. It's, it's my suspicion, I, d I don't know, but I think it, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, it, it only becomes useful when somebody decides for some reason that they want to make use of it. And most of the time that surveillance, um, you know, is neither here nor there. Well, with three panelists from the UK, I just cannot, I just need to ask Thomas what he thinks about it from the continental European position. <laughs> well, speaking for the rest, <laughs> I don't know if I should do that. I think it's, it's an interesting uh, question you brought up there, Peter, because um, I mean, we, we do uh, we do rify curriculum and learning management systems and suddenly things become more visible. I mean, also with the one thing we've, heard from students uh, post uh, uh, pandemic is that they actually like these videos. It was very helpful to be able to join online. Can we record it? And there's a lot of push and pressure to, to sort of store and, and, and or even within our uh, regular uh, education to, to, to store these um, lectures and so on. I, I, I can certainly sense that there's a tension between doing something where you think, well, this is ephemeral and, and then suddenly uh, it's there uh, and, 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 and recorded. Uh, those are two different situations to be a teacher in. So um, I, I certain, certainly can see that. On, on the other hand, I think also, I mean, people do a lot of stuff outside um, the institutional uh, frameworks. Um, it's not necessarily always encouraged, but people start to use other tools. You incorporate Slack because you think it's interesting as long as GDPR kind of in, in opens to it. Well, you can also use the digital to, to, to work outside the institution in a sense where there's less institutional control. And, and that's an, another interesting one in terms of you know, the storage of your lecture material and things like that because again you see this these competing logics on the one hand uh institutions might well or certain elements within the institution might say oh well we've always got um thomas's lectures recorded mm -hmm. so we you know if he buggers off or decides to go off on strike on or something like that we've always got his lecture that we can replay on the other hand you've got the pressure coming from the consumerist angle of students saying, we want lectures to be up to date. Um, and, and all people who are auditing lecture materials, so have you updated your lecture this year? So, you know, the simple thing, I suppose, if you always put a date stamp on your opening slide, then students can see whether a lecture is the most recent thing or whether it's something that's been dragged up from a couple of years back and then they can start complaining. Like, you know, we're, we're paying for something that's two or three years out of date. We want the latest model. So then that collect, collection of, of materials becomes redundant because it's not seen to be the latest, most recent, most up-to-date version of, of whatever's being produced. So again, there's, there's that opportunity for a bit of control there on the part of academics by highlighting the currency of material that you use within a lecture. So it can't simply be taken up and, and used two or three years down the line by institutions. 
And that brings a new uh, definition to post-academic from what people are saying in the comments that it's even happening after people have died. That I was just thinking to... that, Christine. It's incredible, isn't it, that there's um, so many uh, instances of that. Yeah. yeah. It's... <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Post it could be seen in a positive way as a tribute, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really sure it is. Yeah. Well, where you get sort of tribute academics like you have tribute bands. So yes. it's <laughs> people coming up saying uh, dressing up like a certain academic and re delivering their lecture in the future. Uh, yeah. I mean, it does show that there's still this strong um, love of lectures uh, that are not necessarily the best way to do things online um, and uh, I mean a good lecture can be great but uh, but there are lots of other ways of doing things and we keep thinking that that we have to stick with lectures you know that and that I think that I, I'm in an unusual position that I've missed this transition because of the pandemic to the work that kind of work I was doing anyway um, and of course it it turned out not to be quite the same as what I was doing because people were doing it from scratch and having to do it and prepare face-to-face uh, -face teaching at the same time in case the, the lockdown was lifted. So, you know, it really wasn't the same as the position I'd been in as an online teacher. And I feel as though I've missed a whole huge experience that people have had with the pandemic um, of, uh, of of trying to adjust to new spaces and new ways of doing things, um, which I would have found, well, I find very interesting to read about, but I have no experience of it now. Well, thank you very much. I think that we shall take this as a wrap up for our third panel today. So I would like to thank Derek, Thomas, Christine and Sarah for your amazing, amazing contribution to this panel. And of course, to everybody else who, who commented and put so many comments in the chat, which leads me to the last part of the, to the last part of our book launch, which is summary print down, which I'm supposed to do. No pressure at all, just a few hundred, just a few hundred comments and an hour and a half of discussion that needs to be summarized in a few minutes. So what I'm going to do, I took some notes and I will just briefly outline some of the themes that we've been talking about. And then I will just very, very briefly in three or four minutes, give my overall feedback to that and we'll call it a day. So we had, we had three panels today. We started with the first panel, which was making space for the new. And we started speaking about scaling pro online programs, the necessity of uh, taking care about human resourcing, uh, expert capacity, and so on. Of course, we couldn't move much further without the, mentioning the pandemic. So there was a nice discussion about the relationships between the COVID-19 pandemic and really what it means, the old normal, the new normal and how things are moving forward. Of course, this didn't uh, result in many, many firm conclusions because it never does, but it did lead us to the question of social justice and to, to the idea that social justice should be kind of embedded in research and embedded in our education and embedded in our teaching and learning and everything including curriculum later. And then we slightly moved on to the topic of post-digital research. There were some really interesting comments in the chat. Uh, so the story was about going beyond technology, invisible, invisibility of the digital, invisibility of technology. Somebody wrote that it was that post-digital research is challenging and exciting at the same time. And I completely agree. That's why I'm doing it. 
And then we moved on to the second panel, which was vulnerability, care, and identity in online contexts, where we extensively discussed uh, the questions of top-down paternalistic uh, organization and agency. So really the question of how do we, how, how to negotiate people will Different, different levels of vulnerability and people with different care needs. And of course, somehow to, to, to see that it's all respectful and all that in terms of identity. And there was, a lot of, there was a lot of discussion about this, which I'm really perhaps not, not uh, cannot reproduce here at the moment, but there was this very, very interesting concept of uh, an online corridor or just corridor and then I asked what it meant and then it actually seemed that it's a kind of uh, place where people can informally talk to each other like a water cooler place uh, for, for, for informal discussions and this is when we bumped into the notion of post-academic which is really, really, really very interesting notion, which kind of closed down the second panel. In the third panel, which was about examining post-digital curriculum, what we did is that we started with the post-academic again. It started as a joke, but actually it very quickly translated into questions about temporality of the curriculum. So that 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 curriculum is something is as Derek said, and this is probably my only quote here, if I wrote it down correctly, that it's always building on the past, constructed in the present, and looking into the future. I think it's an amazing quote. I will I will write it down and use it, acknowledging you as well. Uh, we we did mention things such as entangled ped pedagogies, values, and then. Derek gave us a really, really nice overview of the problem, the old pro problem really of agency versus structures that actually kind of doesn't really apply it only to curriculum, but also applies to, I would say, to all, all panels we have today. And then when we talked about curriculum translating into practice and about issues of digital or poor digital uh, surveillance and so on, we actually discovered that, that, that people, I mean, we came to the conclusion that people love lectures, but still there's this question of post-mortem academics and so on, which led us to another joke. But, and that's about, and that's about uh, a very, very brief of, overview, six minute overview of what we we're talking about. Now, my reflections will be just two. My first reflection is that whenever we started to speak about practice, somebody would, jump in with a theoretical concept, with an interesting and lovely theoretical and important theoretical concept. And every time that we spoke philosophy for more than two or three minutes, somebody would come with their classroom experiences directly. And I found this, this entanglement between theory and practice in the best sense of critical praxis, something which is hugely important in post-digital research, but it's also something that's hugely important in the book that we are talking about today. Because the book is both theoretically rich, very, extremely theoretically rich, and at the same time, very, very hands-on and very, very practical. This kind of balance is really difficult to achieve. And I think that it's just amazing for me. It's one of the best examples of how research can be both theoretically informed and practical and applicable at the same time. And I think that it's amazing. My second point is, unsurprisingly for this format, is a game that I would like to thank Tim, Jill, and Derek for, not just for the book, but for this amazing setup for this event. Because I was, I haven't been to many events like this, and I've been, I'm slightly worried how I would facilitate, facilitate this whole thing and what's going to come out of it and so on. But actually, it really seems that people need to discuss, people want to discuss. There's comments coming up just now and people are continuing the discussion. And, and this discussion will continue. And it's really, really important to have this 
dialogue and to have this conversation about the book, but also about things that come out of, of the book, things that inspire us for the future, and to talk about ideas and, of course, possible collaborations of what we may do in the future. And this leads me to my very last point. When, when a bunch of us started the post-digital science and education journal and now book series, it wasn't really about creating a, 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 just another publishing outlet. It was, about, it was about creating a certain space, a certain platform where people who think critically, who, who feel critically, people who feel that justice is important, but people who also feel that philosophy is important and people who also feel that theory is important and practice is important and so on, can come and can work together and can do things that maybe would not be so welcome or so encouraged in some other places. And I'm really happy that post-digital science and education works in, in that way. So we are not really uh, some, trying to develop something for, 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 for a specific, we don't really have an idea where this will end, but we know where we are now. What we want to do, we want to provide a platform for this type of critical scholarship and really the book that we are talking about today is probably one of the best, if not the best examples of this that, that, that uh, we've published recently. So thank you very much for coming to this boom launch, to this launch for online postgraduate education in the post-digital world beyond technology. I would like to give special thanks to books editors, Tim Fons, Jill Etkin, and Derek Jones, who made this amazing book happen and who made this amazing event happen. I would also like to thank all the panelists, all the, of course, all authors of all chapters and everybody who, who, who contributed to the book in one way or another. Special thanks to the Society for Research in Higher Education, which allowed us, who allowed us to, to have this event here today. And what I can promise from the position of post-digital science and education that we will continue with this type of work in the future. Whatever, if you have any ideas about any new publications, books, articles, whatever you would like to publish, which works in this direction, we will be very happy to consider it. We will be happy, very happy to discuss things. We will be very happy to enter a dialogue because dialogue is what really matters. The book is only a final product, but this book is actually, like any other book, is a fruit of efforts of, of, of thousands, hundreds and probably thousands of working hours of editors and authors and everybody else. So this, the discussion part is finished. The celebration part is now open. Thank you very much. Congratulations to everything and hope to see you soon. Thanks so much, Peter. Thank you so much. Uh